Welcome back to the session on Ethical Theories, Utilitarianism of Bentham and J. S. Mill. Altruistic Hedonism or Utilitarianism According to altruistic hedonism, universal or general happiness is the ultimate moral standard because it is not a practical preposition to promote the happiness of all persons. We ought to aim at the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Actions are right or wrong according as they are conductive to or subversive of happiness in general. There are many who characterize this doctrine as utilitarianism because according to it actions are to be judged according to the utility or usefulness as means for promotion of greatest happiness of the greatest number. The utilitarianist or altruist admit of the existence of the capacity of sympathy or fellow feeling which impels man to promote the good of others and prevents him from doing injustice to them. Bentham and Mill are the two chief exponents of this view, but they differ in that Bentham recognizes only quantitative distinction of pleasures while Mill recognizes qualitative distinction as well. Like Aristippus, Bentham also recognizes no qualitative distinction among pleasures. All pleasures, physical and mental, are alike. The value of a pleasure, according to Bentham, consists entirely in the quantity of agreeable experience it produces. Pushpin is as good as poetry if they are equal in the quantity of pleasure they produce. Bentham's view. Bentham holds that the only standard of valuation of pleasure is quantitative, but Quantity takes different forms. Quantity has seven dimensions of value. They are number one, intensity. One pleasure is more intense than the other. Of pleasures otherwise equal, the more intense pleasure is preferable to a less intense one. Two, duration. One pleasure is more durable than the other. Of pleasures otherwise equal, the more durable pleasure should be preferred to the less durable. 3. Proximity An immediate pleasure is preferable to a remote one. Present should not be sacrificed to the future. 4. Certainty A certain pleasure is preferable to an uncertain pleasure. 5. Purity A pleasure is pure when it is free from pain. A pleasure is impure when it is mixed with pain. A pure pleasure is to be preferred to an impure one. 6. Fecundity. A pleasure has fecundity when it gives rise to a number of other pleasures. A pleasure which brings with it other pleasures is preferable to a barren pleasure which does not yield any other pleasures. 7. Extent. A pleasure may be enjoyed by a large number of persons or by a small number of persons. A pleasure of greater extent, that is, a pleasure which is enjoyable by a large number of persons is preferable to one of less extent. Bentham is an advocate of typological hedonism. Though Bentham is an altruist and says that we should seek the happiness of others, yet he distinctly says that we naturally seek our own happiness. To obtain the greatest portion of happiness for himself is the object of every rational being. It should be pointed out that Bentham is of opinion that the word happiness is always appropriate because it represents pleasure in an elevated form. Bentham believes in hedonistic calculus. According to him, we should weigh pleasure and should also weigh pains and the question of right and wrong should be decided according as the balance stands. An action is right if it gives pleasure in excess over pain. In calculating pleasures and pain, we take into account the seven dimensions of quantity of pleasure. Bentham's utilitarianism may be called gross or sensualistic because 
it does not recognize any qualitative differences among pleasures. Though Bentham has mentioned purity as dimension of pleasure, yet it has not elevated his doctrine. By purity, he has meant no superior quality, but merely freedom from pain. Yet, Bentham's view is known as altruism or utilitarianism because he has taken into account the external of pleasures, that is the number of persons affected by them. Bentham, by introducing extent as a dimension of pleasure, introduces altruism into his doctrine. Greatest happiness of the greatest number is the moral standard. Criticism on Bentham's theory. Bentham's theory is open to following objections. Number 1. Bentham, though an altruist, believes in psychological hedonism. But psychological hedonism is defective. It is not true that we desire pleasure. We, on the contrary, seek the desired object, which when attained gives pleasure. But we do not directly desire pleasure. Moreover, the more we hanger after pleasure, the less we get it. Besides this, if it is a fact that every man seeks his own pleasure, then there is no meaning in maintaining that everyone should seek his own pleasure. 2. The hedonistic calculus mentioned by Bentham is impracticable. Pleasure and pain cannot be weighed on the two sides of a balance like material things. The feelings of pleasure and pain are subjective and therefore variable. Therefore, nothing can be added to or subtracted from them. 3. Bentham's altruism is, after all, gross or centralistic. He has, however, mentioned purity as one of the dimensions of the quantity of pleasure. But introduction of this dimension has not been able to elevate his doctrine. By purity, he has not meant any superior quality. It only means freedom from pain. There is no qualitative difference among pleasures, but this cannot be accepted. Artistic enjoyment and pleasure of eating sweet meats are different in kind. 4. Bentham also failed to satisfactorily explain the transition from egoism to altruism. He has mentioned extensity of pleasure. In fact, the pleasures which have the dimension of eccentricity, that is, the pleasures that can be enjoyed by greater number of persons are intellectual and aesthetic. Sensuous pleasures cannot be shared by many persons. Therefore, it is evident that extensity of pleasure has a reference to its quality, but Bentham does not seem to recognize any qualitative difference among pleasures. 5. Bentham has mentioned four names of external sanctions to explain the social feelings in men who are by nature egoistic. These laws are obeyed not for their own sake, but for the aggrandizement of our own interest. These external sanctions can create a physical compulsion, but never moral obligation. In choosing to obey, the external sanctions we evince prudence, but prudence is not virtue. Mill's Utilitarianism Mill is a hedonist and an altruist. He explicitly says that the standard is not the agent's own happiness, but happiness in general. It is the happiness of all concerned. According to Mill, actions are right in proportion as they tend to produce happiness wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. The word happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. Mill uses pleasure and happiness as synonymous words. Mill bases his hedonism on psychological hedonism. Desiring a thing and finding it pleasure are according to Mill the two modes of naming the same psychological fact. To desire a thing except in proportion as the idea of it is pleasant, is a physical and metaphysical impossibility. Mill's ethical hedonism is based on this psychological assumption.
he says that we always desire pleasure therefore pleasure is desirable on the analogy that an object is visible because people actually see it a sound is audible because people hear it mill concludes that a thing is desirable because people do actually desire it according to mill each person's happiness is a good to that person and the general happiness therefore is a good to the aggregate of all persons a's happiness is good to a b's happiness is a good to b c's happiness is a good to c therefore the happiness of a b c that is general happiness is good to a plus b plus c that is the aggregate of all persons mill holds that we are bound to promote the general happiness because of the sanctions of morality there are according to mill two kinds of sanctions for altruistic conduct external and internal bentham recognizes four external sanctions physical social political and religious but an appeal to these sanctions means an appeal to the self interest of the individual mill has added to these external sanctions the internal sanction of conscience this internal sanction according to mill is a feeling for the happiness of mankind a desire to be in unity with our fellow beings and a feeling of pain attendant on the violation of duty mill has also given a psychological explanation of the transition from egoism to altruism altruism grows out of egoism sympathy grows out self love according to the laws of association and transference of interest at first we were egoist and relieved the sufferings of others in order to relieve our own miseries then by repetition our own interest became transferred from the end to the means we forgot our own pleasures and took delight in relieving the miseries of others sympathy is thus acquired in the lifetime of the individual bentham recognizes only quantitative differences among pleasures but mill has admitted the qualitative as well pleasures differ in quality as well as quantity epicurus also referred to the kinds of pleasures but he did not recognize the qualitative superiority of intellectual pleasures bentham recognizes purity of pleasure but he does not mean by it any qualitative superiority he means by purity only freedom from pain mill for the first time says that quality is independent of quantity there are different kinds of pleasure and some kinds are more desirable and valuable than others the highest good according to mill lies not in intense or durable enjoyment but in the enjoyment of noble dignified and elevated pleasures even though these are of small intensity and duration hence mills doctrine is called refined utilitarianism as contrasted with bentham's gross utilitarianism in the matter of measuring quality against quantity mill appeals to the verdict of competent judges the verdict of persons who are equipped with and equally capable of enjoying both forms of pleasure naturally goes in favor of intellectual pleasure there can be no appeal of the verdict of competent judges however if there is a conflict of opinion among the competent judges we should abide by the verdict of majority of them it is on account of the existence of the sense of dignity in man that he will never consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of the beast pleasures it is on account of this sense of dignity that competent judges prefer noble pleasures to physical pleasures according to mill it is better to be a human being than a pig satisfied better to be a socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied criticism on mill's utilitarianism 1 according to mill happiness and pleasure are synonymous but happiness is not the same thing as pleasure pleasure is a transient while happiness is abiding pleasure arises from the gratification of a single desire but happiness is a feeling that arises out of systematization of desires 
Mill bases his ethical hedonism on psychological hedonism, but psychological hedonism is fallacious. We do not directly desire pleasure. Pleasure arises when the desired object is attained. Moreover, the more we hanger after pleasure, the less we get it. This is the fundamental paradox of hedonism. 3. In support of altruism, Mill argues that because each person desires his own happiness, therefore general happiness is desired by the aggregate of all persons. But this argument involves two fallacies, fallacy of composition and fallacy of division. Each person's happiness is a good to him, therefore general happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons. Here we argue from the distributive to the collective use of the term. Hence, it involves the fallacy of composition. Secondly, the general happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons. Therefore, the general happiness is good to each person. Here, we pass from the collective to the distributive use of the term. Hence, it involves the fallacy of division. 4. External sanctions cannot account for the feeling of moral obligation. Mill adds to the external sanctions the internal sanction of conscience. But this internal sanction of conscience is, in his view, the subjective feeling of sympathy. Subjective feeling is variable and cannot be the source of moral obligation. When Mill says that conscience is the feeling of pain attendant on violation of duty, he seems to covertly appeal to reason and introduces rationalism in his doctrine. Mill's admission of qualitative difference among pleasures seems to be an admission of an extra hedonistic calculus in measuring the worth pleasures. Of two pleasures, if one is considered to be qualitatively superior to the other, then the quality according to which we judge between the two is not certainly a feeling of pleasure. When we recognize one pleasure as superior in quality to another, we do so by an appeal to reason. Moreover, Mill holds that the sense of dignity that exists in an individual makes him prefer higher pleasures to lower ones. This sense of dignity is surely the product of his reasoning faculty. Therefore, the admission of quality of pleasure as well as the sense of dignity implies the abandonment of hedonism. 6. If the verdict of competent judges is not to be reduced to an act of whim or caprice, then it must be based on the solid ground of reason. Here also, Mill has covertly introduced rationalism in his doctrine. 7. Altruism can never develop out of egoism. Egoism and altruism are two different faculties. The transition from the one to the other cannot be accounted by the law of transference of interest. 8. Mill has made confusion with regard to the interpretation of the word desirable. Sound is audible or an object is visible because we actually hear it or see it. But on this analogy, we cannot say that a thing is desirable because we actually desire it. Audible or visible and desirable are not of the same order. Desirable means what we ought to desire and not what is capable of being desired. Therefore, we cannot say that pleasure is desirable because each man naturally seeks his own desire. Evolutionary Hedonism the theory of evolution maintains that the world and its various objects have come to be what they are by a gradual process of development. According to the evolutionist, morality is also a product of evolution. Moral evolution is form of the general course of evolution. Thus, an adequate explanation of the facts of our moral life must involve a reference to the experiences of our ancestors. Herbert Spencer Lizel Stephen and Alexander have supported this view. Spencer applies the evolutionary thesis for the explanation of the facts of moral life. He traces the origin of morality to the conduct of animals. According to him, life is the continuous adjustment of internal relations to external relations. It is the constant effort of the organism to adapt itself to its environment. Conduct refers to those activities of the organism which help adjustment of the acts to the ends. Good conduct produces pleasure and bad conduct produces pain. Spencer bases hedonism on a biological basis. 
pleasure according to him is an index of increase of life and pain is an index of decrease of life those actions which yield pleasure unmixed with pain are best and those actions which bring pleasure in excess of pain may be said to be comparatively good the ultimate end of life is happiness and its proximate end is the length and breadth of life length is duration of life and breadth is volume or complexity of life in tracing the origin of moral consciousness spencer finds that the essential trait in moral consciousness is the control of some feeling by some other feeling this is affected by some external controls political religious and social these are like the external sanctions mentioned by bentha spencer has mentioned another form of control with moral control which is similar to the feeling or moral obligation or sentiment of duty this has its parallel in mills internal sanction spencer says that the sense of duty or moral obligation is transitory it will diminish as fast as moralization increased consciousness of the obligation arises from the incomplete adaptation of the individual to the social environment of his life there is no moral obligation in the moral consciousness which will completely disappear and people will perform right actions as a matter of habit with the feeling of satisfaction spencer further maintains that there is no conflict between egoism and altruism with the full development of sympathy and fellow feeling the apparent conflict between egoism and altruism will disappear full development of fellow feeling is possible in an ideal society spencer believes in the advent of social millennium which will bring an era of perpetual peace and harmony now let's summarize according to altruistic hedonism universal or general happiness is the ultimate moral standard because it is not a practical proposition to promote the happiness of all persons we ought to aim at the greatest happiness of the greatest number the utilitarianist or altruist admit of the existence of the capacity of sympathy or fellow feeling which impels man to promote the good of others and prevents him from doing injustice to them bentham and mill are the two chief exponents of this view but they differ in that bentham recognizes only quantitative distinction of pleasures while mill recognizes qualitative distinction as well bentham holds that the only standard of valuation of pleasure is quantitative but quantity takes different forms quantity has seven dimensions of value such as intensity proximity duration certainty purity fecundity and extension mill is a hedonist and an altruist he explicitly says that the standard is not the agent's own happiness but happiness in general it is the happiness of all concerned according to mill actions are right in proportion as they tend to produce happiness wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness the word happiness is intended pleasure and the absence of pain mills doctrine is called refined utilitarianism bentham recognizes only quantitative difference among pleasures but mill has admitted the qualitative as well pleasures differ in quality as well as quantity the theory of evolution maintains that the world and its various objects have come to be what they are by a gradual process of development according to the evolutionist morality is also a product of evolution moral evolution is form of the general course of evolution thus an adequate explanation of the facts of our moral life must involve a reference to the experiences of our ancestors herbert spencer lizel stephen and alexander have supported this view there are some assignments for you to work out a critically examine bentham's altruistic hedonism b compare and contrast bentham's and mill's views on hedonism c explain the objections against mill's utilitarianism d briefly explain evolutionary hedonism there are some books for your reference one jadunath sinha 
a manual of ethics, Sinha Publishing House Private Limited, Calcutta, 1976. 2. Professor Sanyal J. and Professor Malik K. N. Ethics, Sri Bhumi Publishing Company, Calcutta, 1965. 3. Bentham, Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation, Chapter 1 and 7, 1789. 4. J. S. Mill, Utilitarianism, New York, 1863. 5. P. H. Novel Smith, Ethics, Penguin Publishers, 1954. Thank you for watching this program. We will meet again in the next session with another topic. Until then, bye.